Welcome, welcome, welcome to this whole life action hour. I'm Ocean Robbins. I am thrilled that you are here with us as we're going to today explore power foods for your brain, for your noggin, to get your thinking clear now and for the long term. You're going to find out what foods are best for your brain health and how you can put them to work for you. You're going to find out about foods that can protect your brain from damaging uh, heavy metals, from bad fats, from whatever poor lifestyle choices you might have made in the past, and how you can optimize going forward. And we have the perfect person with us to guide the journey. We're going to be joined today by Dr. Neil Barnard. Now, I want to be very clear before we get rolling here. Nothing new here today is medical advice. This is coaching. We're sharing our best insights. But of course, always consult, consult with a qualified healthcare professional regarding your unique medical needs and journey. That said, you're going to learn a lot today. This is a project of Whole Life Club, which is Food Revolution Network's ongoing membership community. This week, we are hosting Action Hours with Dr. Neil Barnard today, with Dr. Christy Funk on Monday, and with Dr. Joel Furman on Wednesday. Whole Life Club members get lifetime access to all our Action Hours, including the transcripts and a chance to submit questions in advance, plus a lot more. And if you're interested, stay on to the end I'm going to tell you more about how you can join in with a special opportunity with the doors open just for this week. But right now, we want to talk about brain health. So let me introduce our guest, Dr. Neil Barnard. He is founder and president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He is an adjunct professor of medicine at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Science, founder of the Barnard Medical Center. He's written more than 90 scientific publications and 20 books. You don't do that without a good brain, <laughs> including the New York Times bestseller, Power Foods for the Brain. So Neil, welcome. Hi, great to see you again, Ocean. So glad you're here. So I want to just jump right in and talk a little bit about the status quo. The standard American diet, also called the SAD diet, is leading us to epidemic rates of Alzheimer's and dementia. But a lot of people who are just having brain fog all the time, long before those le that level of symptoms sets in. So can you tell us a little bit about what's so bad about the status quo and how it actually works uh, inside the actual brain? What is it that we're doing that's causing these problems? Yeah, I have to say I've, I've seen this firsthand. Um, my father, um, grew up in the cattle business and uh, didn't like it. He, he left uh, as a young adult and went off to medical school and then became the diabetes expert for Fargo, North Dakota, and which is where we grew up. But um, he, we still ate like we were in the cattle business. And when he was in, late in life, um, he started to develop dementia. And it was a tragic thing. I, he died in 2012, but it was as if he died five years earlier than that because he had trouble remembering things. Uh, he had trouble controlling his, his uh, sort of his behavior, his personality was changing. And you could see here was this intelligent man who'd always been in charge of himself and, and very learned and, and a great doctor. And uh, you could just see him completely decompensating and falling apart. But, but my family history is not unique. Uh, so many people have seen exactly the same thing where a grandparent or a parent or another loved one or a neighbor um, they lose everything, yes. um, and, and, and anything that ever mattered to them. And so then that brings a question back is, is how could foods be associated with this? And I think what you said is really important is that it doesn't start with Alzheimer's disease. It can start just uh, when you're young. Let's say you, you have a, a, a ham sandwich or something, ham and cheese. The saturated fat that's in those things gets into the bloodstream. Uh, it makes the blood gradually thicker more like oil, less like water. And then, so the brain doesn't oxygenate so well because the blood is having more trouble flowing. Athletes will discover this, that they tire out sooner from eating those kinds of, of uh, high viscosity foods, uh, the foods that thicken the blood. So it, it, it doesn't have to be you're 80 years old when this happens. You can see the effects earlier on. But of course, later in life, um, then you see actual physical changes in the brain that are coming as a result of it. And, and the result is really tragic. That's all the bad news. The yeah. good news is that we now know that there are things that you can do to reduce the likelihood that that will ever happen to you. Okay, well, let's 
follow that cue then, <laughs> Dr. Barnard, what are some of those things you can do to reduce the likelihood of that happening? Uh, for me, the, the, the page really turned. In 1993, this is when a study started in Chicago called the Chicago Health and Aging Project. All, all they did was they rounded up a lot of people and asked, what did you have for breakfast today? What did you have for lunch? What did you have for dinner? They carefully tracked the foods that they ate day after day after day. And then they waited to see who would stay mentally clear throughout life and who would develop brain problems, particularly Alzheimer's disease. And it was astounding. There, this became just a treasure trove of, of dietary links with Alzheimer's that have been repeated in other places. But to make it short and sweet, uh, the first thing that they keyed in on was something I knew all about, and that was saturated fat, the, the bad fat. When, when, my, when I was little, my mom had five kids, and we would come down to the kitchen in the morning, and she'd be cooking bacon. She, with, with her fork, she would be pull, pulling the bacon strips out of the pan and put them onto a paper towel to cool down. And then when all the bacon was out of the pan, she'd pick up that hot, bacon grease filled fry pan, and she would carefully pour that bacon grease into a jar to save it. Now that jar didn't go into the fridge, it just went on the shelf, because my mother knew that when bacon grease cools down, it turns into a waxy solid that does yeah. not have to be refrigerated. But the fact that it's solid at room temperature means it's high in saturated fat. So in the Chicago study, Saturated fat was something that some people ate a lot of and others ate not so much. But it turned out that the people who ate a lot of saturated fat, and the amount is about 25 grams a day, um, they had two to three times the risk of Alzheimer's disease compared to people get consuming maybe about half that amount. Now, just that difference. I mean, you can eat much, much less, dramatically less. You can, you can pretty much leave it out of your diet. Um, on a, a, a low-fat vegan diet would have almost no saturated fat at all. Um, but just these modest differences among Chicago uh, participants in this study showed that you could cut your risk of Alzheimer's by you know, half or, or down to two-thirds just with that change alone. So where do you find it? The biggest source of saturated fat is not bacon. It's not sausage. Uh, the number one source is dairy, especially cheese, cheese, whole milk, butter. Number two yep. is meat, especially sausage and bacon, but even chicken and fish have surprisingly large amounts of saturated fat in them. So that's number one. Number two, uh, if you get a cupcake or a donut, that grease that's in there, the trans fats, the partially hydrogenated oils, which are falling out of favor, but they're still being used to, to an extent, um, the trans fats are just as bad as the saturated fat. Uh, if you compare the people in Chicago who are eating trans fats, those who weren't, the difference in Alzheimer's risk was huge. So step one is look at the fat in your diet, get away from fats, get away especially from the animal products because that way you're gonna avoid the saturated fat. And if you, if you skip the snack pastries, you're gonna be avoiding the trans fats too. Thank you, Neil. Um, I think the Chicago um, health, uh, health and aging study Probably, was yeah. fascinating. And I'm curious though, what you say to folks who kind of discount epidemiological studies by saying, well, maybe the healthier eaters who ate less saturated fat were less likely to smoke or more likely to exercise or had more love in their lives or you know, ate less junk in general. Like, do you think that we can look at that data and has it been you know, analyzed from different perspectives enough that you think we can conclusively say that the saturated fat was the causal factor in the Alzheimer's risk? I think you're raising an important point is that this is an observational trial. It's not a randomized study. Um, and there, there are certain situations where you would not want to do a randomized trial. When I say a randomized trial, um, let's say I want to know if cigarettes cause cancer. So I bring in 100 people and 50 of them, I say, I want you to smoke two packs a day. And the others, I want you to be non-smokers. And then 10 years later, you see who's dead. Um, obviously, no <laughs> researcher would do that because you couldn't ethically do such a thing. So for studies like that, we rely on observational uh, findings of people who choose to smoke and you compare them to people who choose not to smoke. But then the question is, could they differ, just as you're saying, Ocean, could they differ in other ways? Maybe the non-smokers or the non-bacon eaters also exercise or something like that if they got better genes. So the, the way we tackle that issue um, is that you can adjust for those things. You look at who is, um, 
you, who are they exercising? Are they overweight? Are they smoking? Are they drinking? And then you, you adjust your data for all of those things. Um, and then when you've shown that even though it's observational data, if you have the same finding again and again and again and again, which is what happened with smoking. Nobody ever did the randomized trial I'm describing, but it was just so obvious that smokers had more lung cancer that yeah. at some point it becomes definitive. That's what happened with bacon, where we know that bacon causes colorectal cancer. It's not that anyone ever did a randomized trial where they said, I want you to eat you know, seven slices of bacon a day. You just couldn't ethically do it. But we, we clearly know that bacon causes colorectal cancer. So with saturated fat and Alzheimer's disease, the study that I was describing, if you look at the unadjusted data, the risk of Alzheimer's disease is about three times or slightly more times higher in the people eating a lot of saturated fat. If you adjust for the lifestyle factors that you were describing, exercise, uh, obesity, and so forth, yeah. um, the difference is a little bit more than double the risk for the high saturated fat group. That's still quite a bit. Uh, if you can, let's put it the other way. If I told you you could better than cut, you, you could cut your risk of Alzheimer's to less than half what it is now by just one change in your diet, and that's avoiding saturated fat, would you do it? You'd say, of course. And th this study and many others have given us many other steps. So we're just talking about step one, which is looking at the bad fats. Uh, so there's, there's a lot more we can do, but yeah, we can, I, I believe that by putting all of these things together, we can probably cut Alzheimer's risk by, I'm guessing, but it probably on the order of 70 or 80%. Yeah, fantastic, thank you. So let's look at some of the other things you can do, especially some of the good stuff that we wanna say yes to. Yeah. Tell us some of your top uh, favorite brain boosting superfoods. Okay, um, this is also from the Chicago study, but many others um, have found the same thing. And they're, they're looking at food sources of vitamin E. Now the reason they're looking at vitamin E is that vitamin E is, as, as you know, an antioxidant. Your body has free radicals forming all the time. Antioxidants knock them out. And vitamin E is in spinach and mangoes and many other foods, but it's especially common in nuts and seeds. Uh, and researchers in Chicago found that those people who ate a fair amount of vitamin E, around eight, uh, I believe it was eight milligrams a day, something like, if I remember correctly, um, they had about 50% less Alzheimer's than the people who were uh, uh, neglecting their vitamin E. So you can add this to, to the benefit of avoiding saturated fat and trans fats. You also have abundant vitamin E. Now, so how do you do it? What I recommend that people do is they can have about an ounce of nuts or seeds a day. And an ounce, if you take your hand, and you pour some sesame seeds or some almonds into the palm of your hand, if it hits your fingers, that's more than an ounce. So you just want an ounce a day. And then the second thing is don't eat it. Crumble it up and put it on your pancakes and your cereal uh, uh, or something like that. Use nuts as an ingredient. And the reason I say that is if you take some almonds or cashews and you put them in your hand and then you put it in your mouth, what happens? you fill your hand again, and then you have more. And while, while the type of fat in nuts is a healthier fat by far than in animal products, it still is a fair amount of fat. And so people are gonna have trouble losing weight if they're eating huge amounts of nuts. So an ounce a day, that's the, on the palm of your hand, have that every day, that'll give you the vitamin E that you need, and that will um, uh, also benefit. There have been some fascinating studies on anthocyanins. Anthocyanins are the dark blue color in blueberries and in grapes. And at the University of Cincinnati, researchers have brought in older people, I'm talking about people nearly 80 years old, who are having um, memory issues. And they gave them in, in two experiments, they gave them two cups a day of either grape juice, a typical Concord grape juice, like you would get at the grocery store, or blueberry juice, and found that it improved their, their uh, memory, it improved their recall. Uh, and it takes about three months to see this effect. Um, the beauty of all this is that there's no negative to it. There's, there's no, no risk to it. These are healthy foods. Fabulous. Since you're mentioning grape juice, um, I want to talk about red wine for a second. There's controversy around this. Of course, we all know that alcohol is causal in a tremendous number of deaths, um, both from drunk driving and also from its long-term health impacts. But um, there are some people who are of the belief that red wine is beneficial for health long term. 
Um, what's your take on that? And relatedly, if there are benefits from red wine, is red grape juice the same or better? Um, you're putting your finger on a really important question, Ocean. And um, the answer is, is really yes and yes. Um, there, are, there do appear to be benefits from wine consumption and maybe alcohol in general in two ways. Um, there can be a slight reduction in cardiac risk and slight reduction in Alzheimer's risk. However, as you said, the negatives are huge. Um, women who drink alcohol have a stepwise increase risk of breast cancer, and it just goes straight up. Um, if you have even one drink a day, if it's every day, your risk of breast cancer is measurably higher. If it's two drinks, three drinks, it just goes straight up. Um, but it's not just breast cancer, it's colorectal cancer, it's pancreatic cancer, many other sites, and these are things you don't want. Uh, not to mention, as you said, drunk driving and all the just addictive waste of time problems uh, that people have as a result of, of uh, people getting hooked on, on alcohol. So I have to say, on balance, it's a negative. Um, I, I think rather profoundly so. Um, so researchers have asked the question, is it the alcohol? It may be, um, but the alcohol that, that comes out of a grape, it comes accompanied by, as I mentioned, anthocyanins and there's lots of other compounds. So that's why the researchers at the University of Cincinnati said, keep your red wine. We're just gonna look at the grape. And that's when they found these same benefits uh, from the use of, of grape juice itself. So I have to say, um, my recommendation is, is, is always to get the, your benefits in a different way. Now, I, one little caveat on that. Um, a number of researchers have said that um, if women are drinking alcohol, but they also have a very high intake of high folate foods, that's green leafy vegetables especially, uh, folate is a B vitamin, that that will help reduce their, the, it will reduce that increased breast cancer risk, it'll bring it down a little bit, because they feel that the alcohol is destroying the folate in their body. And that's why they have more breast cancer risk. So you just restore more folate and you're gonna be all right. Um, there is something to that, that when, when women consume more folate, they do better. But I, I, think on, I think on balance, it's better to get your benefits from, other, from things other than alcohol. Yeah, okay. Well, let's talk about a little bit about blueberries, which is also something related here. And um, specifically, I'm sure you're aware of some of the studies showing that people who consume blueberries regularly can have better cognitive function long-term. Yes. Um, what, what are the best ways to eat blueberries? And what about wild blueberries? Um, my, the, the short answer is we don't really know. And th this, this um, inquiry kind of began with looking at other antioxidants, lycopene, for example, which is the red color in a tomato. Uh, it reduces the risk of prostate cancer. So the question was, what form should you get it in? And you would think, well, I want it in a natural form. So it's in a tomato, it's in watermelon, that the red color inside a watermelon, that's lycopene, a pink grapefruit, same story. However, the researchers, the researchers discovered that lycopene reduces the risk of prostate cancer a lot by about, oh, 35% or so. If people have a lot of lycopene, even if it's in pizza sauce, even if it's in ketchup, um, so then you know, looking at, 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 um, at, at grapes and, and so forth, the question is um, grape jelly, grape jam, uh, fresh grapes, who knows? Um, we, we don't really know the answer to that. My, my best guess is that the grapes themselves are probably the most helpful source, but if it's grape juice without added sugars, you're probably gonna get good concentrated anthocyanins as well from those sources. With something like uh, a grape jelly, it's probably got so much um, in the way of additives that it's probably not doing much good. And wild grapes and wild berries and blueberries, fine, absolutely fine. Yeah, I think there are some data that wild blueberries are, are actually a variety of blueberry. I'm not sure that they're actually wild, but they're a variety that's smaller, a little bit less sweet, and I guess much higher in some of the beneficial compounds, even than yes. regular blueberries. For people who are wondering what we're talking about, I've been using this word anthocyanins. That's what's in the blueberry, the wild blueberry, also the grape. Um, if you look out your window um, on a November day or a January day or whatever, if there's a few of those orange and red leaves left from, from the autumn, um, the nature's painting box is anthocyanins. So the green leaves of summer 
you're seeing all the chlorophyll um, in them. But as autumn comes along, the anthocyanins are manufactured. And so all those oranges and, and reds are anthocyanins, but the same is true with the purple colors that are in blueberries and in grapes. Yeah, beautiful. Literally. <laughs> Thanks, exactly. Neil. Um, so let's talk about some of the other great brain boosters. Cruciferous vegetables are certainly high on anyone's list. Yeah, well, cruciferous vegetables are good in a couple of ways. Um, I guess everybody knows that they're a good calcium source. Uh, for all the people who say, if you're not drinking milk, where do you get your calcium? Um, well, green leafy vegetables are actually, that's where the cow is getting calcium, come to think of it, because the cow is eating the grass, and that's where the calcium came from but broccoli and collards and kale and Brussels sprouts will give you great uh, calcium. But, they, but there's much more to them than that. Um, all of these plants are foliage, and that's why they have folate, which I mentioned earlier, it's a B vitamin, and it's um, important in the brain. I was discussing it just now in the context of alcohol destroying folate. But what does the folate really do, and why do I wanna have some broccoli in my routine all the time? Uh, folate is a B vitamin, as I mentioned, it helps your body to eliminate a compound called homocysteine. And that's sort of factory waste. Your cells are making homocysteine all the time. And if you have a lot of B vitamins because you ate your broccoli today, you're gonna to be able to get rid of that homocysteine. That's important because as homocyst homocysteine builds up, it's toxic to the body, including the heart, and apparently including the brain. Um, so the green vegetables are good. Um, the one caveat I have, is that for a lot of folks, they think, all right, I'll have my broccoli raw. Actually, the cruciferous vegetables, in my view, are be you're better off with them cooked because they do have some natural toxins in them that when you cook them, you're eliminating them in a good way. So if you can tolerate them raw, that's not bad, but you'll find they're more digestible and probably healthier if you actually cook them a bit. Thank you. So let's talk a little bit about one of the controversial foods, at least to some people, which is coffee. And perhaps in the same conversation, we can talk a little bit about tea, both of them having caffeine, both of them having been linked to some positive benefits for cognitive function, both short-term and long-term. What's your take on their um, health efficacy? Um, it's an interesting thing. Um, first of all, it should be said that coffee is totally unnecessary in the diet. Um, caffeine has no nutritional value at all. Um, and over time, I have to say, I think that when people get hooked on caffeine, although it helps them some, it also kind of digs a hole in their lives too that has to be filled every morning so they can function. Now, all that negative stuff said, uh, researchers have looked at caffeine and Alzheimer's disease and found that coffee drinkers have less, uh, less risk of Alzheimer's. Now, to get that benefit, you have to drink a lot of coffee on the order of about five cups a day um, to get that. And, and the mechanism has not ever been, in my view, adequately explained. Um, so uh, coffee does seem to be beneficial and the risks of it are really modest, you know, jitters and that kind of thing. Uh, by the way, declaration of, of biases here, I, I don't drink coffee, never have, so I'm not making a pitch for it um, necessarily, but it does seem to have some uh, Alzheimer's prevention effects. <laughs> Thanks, Neil. In declaration of biases, I, I do partake from time to time, but, uh, but not daily. I like to take breaks so that I don't get addicted or, well, you know attached to it too much. Well, you know, the, I think the most important question about coffee really isn't so much the coffee as what goes in the coffee. You know, there's some people who will go to the local coffee spot and the barista will put in half coffee and half cream or milk or all this glop and a lot of sugar and so forth. And so the, the, the coffee is now being used as a vehicle for saturated fat. And, and, problems, and sugar, foods, and, and sugar, foods yeah. that are going to cause more problem for, problems for them um, as time goes on. So um, if, but, but on the other hand, um, even though I'm not a coffee drinker and, I have, and I, it's not my thing, I personally find it really difficult to make any kind of health case against uh, a cup of black coffee. I, just, I really don't think there are big negatives apart from the obvious CNS effects. Yes, thank, thanks, Neil. Um, now let's talk a little bit about turmeric. And first, a bit of context. Um, in India, billion people in India, rates of Alzheimer's for people between the ages of 70 and 79 are about a quarter what they are for people in that same age group in the United States. So uh, some people think that's partly because Indians in general eat a more plant-based diet. Close to half the population is vegetarian. Uh, some people think it may also be connected to the high levels of turmeric 
in the Indian diet. The average Indian gets about a teaspoon a day. What's your thought on why India's rates are so much lower than those in the United States? And do you think turmeric might be a factor? Um, it's an interesting observation. And I think, I think what we're seeing is, is as you said, um, in, uh, in India, vegetarian diets are a part of the tradition. And so what that means is that a huge part of the population is not eating meat at all. So all of the cholesterol and all the saturated fat is gone. And that's a good thing. Um, how, and the other piece of it is if you're not eating meat, you're, you're, something is taking its place. So you're having lentils, spinach, other green vegetables, and so forth, which is, which is good. And turmeric and, and, and other spices as well um, are integral parts of the cooking. Turmeric has antioxidant effects, um, and there have been quite a lot of studies on, the, on it, and that may be part of the benefit. However, I, I am concerned about what I'm seeing in India right now, and that's uh, really two things. The first thing is that India is becoming more homogeneous. It used to be that you'd see quite a difference in the diet in the south and the diet in the north. Um, in the south, there was less use of dairying, more in the north. Um, it's now becoming kind of all the same. Um, the increased use of dairy products is adding a huge amount of saturated fat into the diet. The second thing is that vegetarian diets are by some people, some young people, they're viewed as old fashioned. And so they will often, you're, you're boarding a plane and on the plane they'll say, do you want the vegetarian meal or the non-vegetarian meal? And some young people will say with pride, I'm non-vegetarian because to be vegetarian meant you were like your grandparents. And they say, no, I wear jeans, I like Hollywood movies, and I'm not vegetarian. And I have to say, I find that tragic. Yeah. Uh, because, because what that means is that all the diet-related diseases are coming back, and that means diabetes, uh, which is exploding now in, in India, um, partly due to dairy and oil, but it, due to the increased influx of, of meat as well. Um, but uh, to that list is, as, is it being added Alzheimer's disease where Alzheimer's disease is historically low in this plant-based diet country and is becoming more and more common, we believe. Yeah, it so, is. So that's, that's the tragedy, but we can draw a lesson from it. And the lesson is um, go back to our uh, plant-based traditions and that'll be helpful for us. Yeah, thank you. You know, I've worked with leaders in over 65 countries uh, over the last several decades. And as I traveled the world, I kept seeing that everybody eats, um, but also that what we eat has this huge impact and that the United States is exporting a way of producing food with pesticides and factory farms and GMOs and herbicides and fungicides and mass production and ways of processing food and, and ways of marketing food with the spread of KFC and McDonald's and Baskin Robbins all over the world. And as this is spreading, as the standard American diet is globalizing, waistlines are expanding and hospitals are filling up and people are getting sick with diseases that their grandparents didn't even know about. And this is happening in India, in China, and many other parts of the world. And so as an American, I feel this kind of responsibility to say to the whole world, like, don't follow us, you know? <laughs> and, and let's learn from people who are still living in traditional ways that work better so that we can apply some of their wisdom, obviously, in the modern world, in the context of our lives. The irony is that just as other countries are westernizing their diets, America is starting to easternize its diet. Uh, when I was a kid growing up in Fargo, I, I have to tell you, I never had a samosa. I didn't know what spinach curry was. You know, I yeah. never had any of these things. Um, but now these are things that we have all the time. And a huge, huge number of people in the United States are learning lessons from other countries um, and taking advantage of the, of the diets that have allowed them to be healthier. But conversely, in China, as you mentioned, uh, due to increased uh, buying power, that has, uh, it's been, been gradually growing in China now for quite a number of years. Um, there's a huge increase, particularly in pork consumption. Um, and as you know, por uh, a Chinese company bought Smithfield Foods, the biggest pork producer in the world, if I understand right, um, and to feed their, their appetite. And as you track that, what's happening? Uh, a huge increase in cardiovascular disease, certain cancers. And as that's happened, the pharmaceutical industries are perched like buzzards on the wire, realizing that they're going to be able to sell insulin yeah. and Lipitor and uh, more and more medication. And it's a, it's a tragedy to see. But, but the, the take-home lesson is let's 
take advantage of the healthful foods that many, many cultures have made their wonderful traditions and uh, be wary, wary of uh, the westernization that takes those traditions away. Yes, absolutely. I want to get now to some of the questions that have come in from our Whole Life Club members um, who are very excited to hear from you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so we'll just go through those and see if we can cover a bunch of them. Jack yeah. asked, um, what is your position on algae-based DHA supplements for improving and preserving cognitive function? And what uh, does the evidence tell us? Okay, it's a, it's a really open question. Um, this started really not with the algae-based ones, but it started with fish oil where uh, fish oil got on the market and uh, it was being sold like, this is gonna help you with everything, it'll help your heart, it'll help your brain. And the studies by and large did not support it. Um, it really didn't help. Um, and then out of the blue came a surprising finding that men consuming fish oil capsules or really omega-3s of any kind, um, or, or frankly men who had a high um, DHA, EPA intake, say even from fish, had higher risk of prostate cancer. And when this first came out in studies, researchers were scratching their heads because there's no obvious reason for it. And it was thought to be a fluke, but there has been more and more study and it seems like it's true. Um, so um, file away that bit of evidence that there's something about these fish oils that seems to increase the risk of prostate cancer. But then there's a whole other chunk of evidence that looks at if people are really low in omega-3s, you, you do a blood sample and their DHA level in their blood is low. There has been some suggestion that they would be at higher risk of Alzheimer's disease later. Now, that's not necessarily true, but it could be. Um, so what do you do? And the answer is, I don't know. But what you can do, if you like, is you can test yourself and see if you're high or low, because if you're high, there's certainly no reason to be adding any extra. So there are companies like Omega Quant, for example, you go online and the, uh, the Omega Quant website will say, okay, give us some money and we'll send you a card and you put a drop of blood on the card. And then six weeks later, they'll tell you you're low or you're high in DHA in your blood. Um, what they do is that they are able to measure in your blood cells, the quantity of Omega-3 that you have. And if you're low and you decide to supplement, then you can get retested later. I'm not necessarily pushing this, but this is what people can do. If you are taking a DHA EPA supplement, I think what the questioner uh, mentioned is the way to do it. I would not do it with fish oil. I would do it with a vegan supplement. They're derived from algae. They have everything that's in the fish oil except the stink and the mercury and the, and the environmental <laughs> issues. Um, and so you can get vegan DHA online and then you can test yourself and see if you're doing better. None of this sets aside the question about prostate cancer, nor does any of it mean that you're actually gonna prevent Alzheimer's disease. But the reason that we have to hedge on that is we don't know. Nobody's really done a, t a test to see if this has that benefit. Thank you. And for those who are interested, the Omega Quant test that Neil just mentioned, the website is omegaquant, Q-U-A-N-T dot com. Um, question from Tracy who said, I've recently taken over as a caregiver to my mom who's 99 years old. She has dementia and I'm trying to correct her diet, especially her sugar intake and hoping it will help. Are there any specific foods or supplements I can give her to help reverse this disease? Everyone tells me to just let her eat what she wants as she has earned it. Can her dementia be corrected at her age? Okay, let me say that for everybody who says that patronizing stuff that you're old so you have earned the right to eat terrible food and live in miserable health, um, that's just nonsense. I think we really have to, have to get away from that. And I saw this with my own parents. Um, my own parents were following a pretty healthy diet. And then they moved into what I'm gonna call an old folks home, where the cafeteria manager said, oh, these people are old. They don't wanna change their diets. I'll let them reap the rewards of all the work they've done. So they were feeding them steak and the, you know, the healthy thing was fish. They didn't, I mean, healthy in quotes, they didn't have vegan or vegetarian options. And I have to say that's, that's wrong. I would go, to, go there and I would give lectures um, at the old folks home. And I would ask them, would you like to try vegan foods? If they were served here, would you eat them? Every hand goes up. Why? Because they're on fistfuls of medication. They don't want to be on them. They'd like to be healthy. Um, and the fact that a person is older doesn't mean that they have resigned themselves to feeling rotten every day. Um, now, that said, this doesn't necessarily mean 
that diet changes will or will not help uh, Alzheimer's. Where we see the tremendous benefit is in reducing the risk it will start. You're preventing it. If it's already begun, in the very early stages, what we call mild cognitive impairment, where a person is having memory lapses, though that's the time when we're seeing some benefit of the blueberries um, and the grape juice that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and the, the dose that was used was two cups per day. There also, these are the, are the, this is the population where you see regular physical exercise being helpful. Now it's gotta be done under supervision if a person is a bit confused or if they're unstable on their feet. But um, researchers at the University of Illinois showed that a 40 minute brisk walk three times a week measurably reversed brain shrinkage and increased um, memory. Um, so there's no downside to exercise as long as it's done with supervision. Thank you, Neil. Um, we heard from Tony who said, I have a question about weight loss. I've been following everything you say. I eat plant-based, no oils, etc. cetera. A few nuts, or no, few nuts. Really not losing weight. I'm not sure what the problem is. I do not have any chronic illnesses. Wondering what I need to do differently. I am losing a pound per week, but it's up and down. Not sure why I'm not losing faster and would appreciate some response. I've read Dr. Barnard's books and now we'll follow more closely how much fiber I'm eating. Any thoughts would be helpful. Okay, uh, first of all, it's a great question. Um, we do research studies here and we've had thousands of people come through. And let me say, if you're actually averaging a pound a week, that's great. Um, there are 52 weeks in a year. Um, and when people gain weight before they become vegan, they're, years, years are going by, your average American gains about a pound and a half per year. That's it. Um, so after 10 years, they've gained 15 pounds. After 20 years, they've gained 30 pounds. Um, that's kind of a, a good average. Um, so if you're losing a pound a week, that's fantastic. Don't try to lose weight faster than that. Fad diets try to tell you, you can lose seven pounds in a week. Don't do that. Those people regain that weight later. Um, now, if it's down a pound and then back up and you're not losing weight at all, then I think what you're thinking is right. Vegan, no animal products, that's number one. Number two, be careful with the oily foods and the nuts and seeds. And despite what I said earlier about having some nuts in your diet, if weight loss is a goal for you, at that point, I would set aside the nuts and the avocados and the other fatty foods because they are the most calorically dense foods that people eat. And that goes for oils too. For any serving of food or any ingredient that goes in, I would make sure it has no more than about three grams of fat. You'll hear all kinds of people telling you, no, fat isn't the problem, it's the problem is sugar and so forth. No, the, the problem really is fat um, because it's very dense in calories. And when you get that out of there, you, your, your weight loss is gonna be maximized. So anyway, you've done great so far. Keep it up and let's see how it goes. Thanks. Um, Victoria said, I'd love to hear Dr. Barnard's advice to parents of children with autism spectrum disorder. Thoughts on autism and uh, advice there. Yeah, um, it, it's a great question. And the answer is we don't know. Um, researchers have been looking at, at a number of behavioral issues. Um, autism is one, hyperactivity and, and attention deficit disorder is another. Um, and we really don't know the answers to this. But the, the exploration started with Ben Feingold a uh, generation ago, where he said, okay, first take out the colors and the preservatives. And that helped a few kids, not many, uh, but some. And then other researchers said, well, let's go further. Let's get rid of the sugar, the caffeinated sodas, and let's get rid of dairy. Because surprisingly enough, some kids react apparently to the dairy protein. And then they're seeing some benefits there. Um, so, I think people should certainly try these things. Um, and if, a if, if parents have an autistic child, or, or frankly, parents of, with any kids um, would do well to have them have a, a healthful vegan diet. And a vegan diet means vegetables and fruits and whole grains and legumes, meaning beans and lentils, those four groups, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans. Also make sure your child has a B12 supplement and you've got to take it yourself. Um, that's essential. Uh, vitamin D if you're not getting sunlight, but that's it. And I would set aside the junk food and the sugary food, the overly processed things and see how things go. None of this takes the place 
of working with uh, your physicians and your, or your medical team and seeing if there are any other issues going on and making sure that, that you've taken care of the other issues. So your, your child is lucky to have you for a parent and you might try some of those things to see if they're helpful. Thanks so much, Neil. And I'll say, speaking personally for a moment, we have identical twins who are 18 years old and they're on the autism spectrum. They're doing wonderfully and they have their own unique neurological challenges that they deal with in life. And of course, anybody who is working with autism is probably gonna hope for a reversal of those symptoms. But even absent that, there's a whole range of uh, possibility with any, within anybody's life and neurological context. And so when you eat well and you live well, you optimize the chances for optimal thriving and wellness. And so our kids are vibrant, energetic, loving, generous, kind, confident uh, people who certainly have their challenges and they also have incredible gifts. They've published a book of fables. They've come out with a CD album of the band they're in. They've spoken in front of a thousand people at a big environmental rally. They're, they're getting out there and, and I'm very proud of them. And I think that a whole foods plant-centered diet, uh, along with a lot of love and other valuable resources has, has been very helpful to say the least. Um, and one last piece I would add is anecdotally, there are quite a few people who have described uh, improvement of symptoms related to autism from going off dairy products and also in some cases gluten. Not everybody, so um, it's not like a cure-all, but there are a lot of anecdotal stories about that. Um, so now let's move to Rachel, who said, my husband had a family history of, of Alzheimer's. I'd like to hear about more about eating well to minimize dementia and Alzheimer's. I think we've kind of been covering that. <laughs> um, anything additional you think Rachel should hear that we haven't already addressed? Yes, um, for many folks, I, I, I'm glad that, that, that you're raising that question um, because I'm sure that Rachel is thinking, is this a genetic issue? And if it is, if it is genetic and that's why it's running through families, are we just condemned and are, will our kids have this? Um, it's an interesting thing. There is a gene called the ApoE Epsilon 4 allele. If you got it from one parent, your risk of Alzheimer's is tripled. If you got it from both parents, it's increased by 10 to 15 fold. However, researchers have looked at people who have that gene. And if they happen to avoid the bad fats, as we were talking about at the beginning of this program, their risk of having old age memory problems is reduced. So that has been a puzzling thing. You think, wait, 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 you know, if it's a gene, wouldn't it just happen and there's nothing you could do about it? Well, we learned from smokers that there, there are genes for, for, for lung cancer, but the way those genes work is they, some of these genes help your body to eliminate uh, carcinogens. And if you have a mutation of those genes, you can't eliminate carcinogens. So what does that mean? What that means is that a person who can't eliminate carcinogens is more likely to have lung cancer, but let's say you never took up smoking you're not inhaling carcinogens, the gene is irrelevant. So that's lung cancer. With Alzheimer's disease, let's say there are genes for Alzheimer's disease that happen to do with how the body processes the bad fats in such a way that you're at higher risk, but you do happen not to ever eat the bad fats, then maybe those genes can be made irrelevant. So here's my point. Alzheimer's does seem to run in families, as do many other things, but so do recipes run through families. And when we change those recipes, oftentimes our destiny takes on a very different shape. Yeah, that's so true. We don't just inherit genes, we also inherit habits, don't we? Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and so the, the real pieces of it, plant-based diet, that, that with a plant-based diet, you're gonna avoid this, the saturated fat and avoid the trans fats that are in snack pastries. Get a little bit of vitamin E each day, that's in the nuts and seeds, just a tiny little bit. Lots of green leafy vegetables, lace up your sneakers, um, get regular exercise. And one other thing that we haven't talked about yet, be sure to sleep. Um, modern folks tend to stay up because there are just so many things to do. We have obligations and so forth. But my personal rule is 10 o'clock, lights out. I don't care how busy I am, 10 o'clock, lights out. You're going to get a good night's sleep. And then if you wake up a little bit early in the morning to, to do work or something, fine. But sleep allows the brain to recover in the same way as an athlete who never stops training um, and is just pushing, 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 never gives the body a chance to actually heal. And so your, your brain has that need as well. Um, so put those to, to work and you can see how you, how you can do. Hmm, thank you. 
uh, very hard to study this, but I have a personal theory that dreams are good for brain health too. I think well, that well, there's well, something well, about that letting go and allowing the unwinding to happen in the psyche that, that the brain is actually acting in a very different way than in waking life. And I think it might be beneficial. Um, you're, you're, you're right. And there, there is some science behind this. And let, let's just walk through this in a little more, more detail. Let's say I hooked up um, EEG leads on your head and it's 10 o'clock at night and you're lying down on your pillow and you're going to sleep. And I'm watching um, with the EEG what's happening in your brain. And as you go to sleep, in the, during the first half of the night, we see what's called slow wave sleep. The brain waves slow down. And during this part of the night, your body is integrating uh, facts, words that you've learned. Um, it's, it's as if your brain has been accumulating file folders of mess that, you're, that you've been throwing on a desktop all day long. And now your brain says, you stop. I'm going to file all this stuff away so we can find it again. Um, so if you're awake until one in the morning, you're losing the slow wave sleep and you'll have memory problems the next day. Now, in the early morning hours, though, I'm talking about 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m., um, the, the brain waves change and you're now seeing, seeing a lot of REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. The eyes are darting around and you're dreaming. And when people are dreaming, you notice how your dreams are often infused with a little bit of emotion uh, of various kinds. And yeah. Your, your brain is integrating emotions, and also at the same time you're integrating physical skills, uh, like play on the clarinet or your tennis game or your golf game. That's in, in the early part of the morning, your body is not moving, but the, the brain is integrating whatever physical skills you've had and getting your emotions back in gear. If you stayed up all night long and you do this day after day as some busy parents do, or as I used to do when I was an intern in the, in the hospital, you're just not sleeping, two things happen. You're, you're missing your slow wave sleep, so your memory is shot, and you get grumpy because you're, um, you are uh, not getting your REM sleep um, either. And then people turn to coffee and other things to try to make up for it, and it becomes a, 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 a really bad cycle. And if you can just stop and sleep without being under the influence of alcohol and caffeine and all this kind of stuff, and just let your brain rest, it's amazing how, how brain function can come back and how, mm. how well people can feel. Mm, thank you. Um, Patricia asked about the effects of wireless G4 and G5 technology and perhaps relatedly cell phones. And I'm curious your thoughts, do those have an impact on brain health? And if so, are there any foods that might help? I have no idea. Um, people have been looking at this ever since the cell phone became popular. People were wondering, you've got the thing straight into your head. Um, it, are, are there risks uh, to it? So far, the results of studies have been quite encouraging, but I have the same concern that you, that you have, which is <laughs> you would think there would be a way that would, that would have biological effects. The short answer is I just don't know, and, and, or, which is to say we just don't have any data that help us to answer that question. Yeah, and unfortunately, a lot of the studies that seem to show no effect are funded by the cell phone industry. Ah, uh, you which, said it which is uh, unnerving, but also at best inconclusive. So, right. yeah, um, so word of caution, um, try to be on the safe side with stuff like that. Um, keep your cell phone, uh, use speakerphone or you know a headset, a Bluetooth headset. Don't hold your phone against your face all day long. It's probably not a good idea. Um, even though we're not certain, there is some evidence that it could be linked to higher rates of brain cancer and other ailments potentially. And um, if you have wireless technology in your home, keep it far away from your bed. Don't have a router or a wireless router right next to your bed or right next to your desk or anywhere where you spend a large amount of time because the farther you are away from those devices, the less powerful they are. There's a lot of controversy about G5 technology. I don't think we can get into all of that now except Neil and I are probably both in the place of saying we don't know. <laughs> and right. sometimes what we don't know ends up being very problematic, sometimes not. Um, but we do the best we can with what we've got. And I'll tell you what, if you're being exposed to radiation from external sources, all the more reason to eat well, move well, love well, live well, and then you'll optimize your chances of being able to deal with it well. Good. Uh, Judith said, my son had a brain bleed four years ago. He was taking Keppra, which he believes makes him really tired. He also takes warfarin due to blood clots in his lungs four years ago. He's plant-based. What would you suggest regarding diet and any thoughts on CBD? 
Okay, well, first of all, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that he's had to deal with this challenge. Um, the yeah. one piece of that that uh, I need to jump in on is that he's taking warfarin, which is a blood thinner. And um, I know that some of the other people listening to this, their ears probably pricked up because this has been a, used as a reason to not follow a plant-based diet. Um, and, and the way it works is this. Uh, warfarin helps thin the blood, um, so that, that will help uh, a person to prevent the formation of a clot, which, which is all good. However, if you eat a lot of vegetables, green leafy vegetables, for example, the, the vitamin K in them um, would counteract the effect of warfarin. So doctors say, don't eat all those vegetables. But the patient says, wait a minute, I need these vegetables. These are healthy for me. I want to have them. And the doctor says, no, it's going to counteract your medication. Two things. Number one, it's there, you can go ahead and eat the vegetables. It's just a question of making sure that the amount that you eat is about the same day after day after day. That way your doctor can set the dose of warfarin that you need and you're going to be fine. So it is not a reason to avoid the vegetables. Number two, there are more modern drugs than warfarin. They're expensive uh, for the moment, but they don't require any kind of uh, dietary restrictions the, the way warfarin has. So talking to your doctor about them, uh, you can get on that regimen if you wish to. Great. Thank you. Uh, any thoughts on CBD? Stay tuned. Um, it's very much like what you're describing, where you have industry pushing products, um, hoping to sell things. And I have to say, I think that's what we're seeing with CBD. Um, lots of people saying that it will cure what ails you. And frankly, from my standpoint, I'm not yet convinced. Okay, thank you. Um, we, and, and again, this is not medical advice. This is sharing your own best in, insights, but as in all things, consult with a qualified healthcare professional regarding your medical choices and so forth. Um, Diane, uh, actually, no, we'll, we'll jump to um, Sied, who said, I'd appreciate if you could touch on intermittent fasting and its role in brain function. We have a lot of patients in, pra in our practice suffering from illnesses. So I guess Sied may be a healthcare practitioner. Okay, I think intermittent, first of all, it's okay to do intermittent fasting, um, except if you're doing fasting because you um, overindulged from Monday through Thursday or overeating, so now you're going to fast on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to try to make up for it, I would suggest not doing that. I would suggest following a healthy diet with grains and beans and vegetables and fruits all the time because the high fiber content of these foods means that it will limit your excesses anyway, naturally. So you're gonna have less, like, less need to do that. On the other hand, there are people who will do actual fasting fasting uh, for long periods of time, water fasts, and with great benefit, uh, particularly for autoimmune conditions and so forth. There's a place called True North uh, uh, in Northern California where they've been doing this for a long time. The big caveat here is that it has to be done under medical supervision because it's dangerous. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean it's a bad treatment. It's not, it's quite the opposite. Many people have benefited enormously, but do not do this on your own. Uh, if you fast for a day, fine. Two days, okay. Um, if you're doing an extended fast, do it only under supervision. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, last question here from Barbara. Do you know a, a reliable source of information on how to implement a plant-based diet for bariatric patients? Yeah, um, a couple things. Um, at our website, pcrm.org, you'll see lots of information on using a healthy diet, healthy plant-based diet for weight loss. Um, and you may know the work of Garth Davis, who is uh, a terrific surgeon who does bariatric surgery, but all of his patients hear about going on a plant-based diet before the surgery, so that they slim down as much as possible so they're a better surgical candidate. In some cases, they never need it at all. And certainly after surgery, because otherwise uh, they tend to regain the weight. So for people who have gained really quite a lot of weight, a plant-based diet is always your way to go. Um, and if you get there uh, ahead of having surgery, you may not need surgery at all. Thank you. All right, well, that wraps up all the questions we have time for today. Thank you to all of our Whole Life Club members for your questions and input and participation. Neil, any final thoughts you wanna share on brain health and how we can live and uh, in ways that support it and optimize it. Um, let me just tell you something I'm really excited about. Um, there are a lot of folks who have had um, what I'm gonna call a hormonal issue of one type or another, menopause. And they're feeling, I've got brain fog from menopause or their thyroid gland is not working so well. These hormonal questions, whether it's sex hormones and menopause, thyroid hormones or others, 
um, are things that people had thought were beyond their control. But we have recently been doing a lot of work on showing how foods can adjust hormones. Um, and that can mean a cure for menstrual cramps or improving menstrual cramps, endometriosis, PCOS, fertility issues, all kinds of things. And, and if you don't mind my mentioning this, I got so excited that I have pulled all this together in a book that's called Your Body in Balance. And it's coming out shortly. And for me, um, I've been so used to dealing with diet for diabetes and weight problems and cholesterol. The idea that something like menstrual cramps or infertility or hot flashes could relate to food is so exciting. So I hope people will have a look at your body in balance and, uh, and see if that can be another piece of this puzzle. Fantastic. Your body in balance. Book number 21 from <laughs> Dr. Neil Barnard. And uh, I'm sure you're saving, you, you, you're putting so much into this as you do with all your books. I'm, I'm excited. I can't wait to read it. Thank you for your brilliance. Uh, for those who are not aware, we are really here right now with a living legend. Um, Dr. Neil Barnard has been guiding this movement for decades and his work is legendary. He's conducted so many studies. He's provided a lot of the research backbone that enables us to truly understand the impact of our food choices and especially the benefits of whole foods, plant-based dietary patterns on long-term health. Um, and Neil, you aren't just uh, helping us understand the data, you're helping us implement it. Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine does absolutely brilliant work with helping people cook and live in ways that are optimal for their health, sharing the data, changing the way that nutrition is taught in medical school, changing the way that nutrition is, is taught in elementary school, changing the foods that are served in government institutions, changing the way that consciousness spreads, changing the way that medicine is practiced, and you're at the forefront of all of it. So Neil, I just wanna thank you so much for your wisdom, for your leadership, for your brilliance, and for your time with us today. Well, thank you, Ocean, right back at you. You have been really spreading the word you will never know how many people whose lives you've touched and how many lives you have saved. Uh, but what you have done is, is nothing less than phenomenal. And that goes back to your dad, uh, John, who I met for the first time more than a generation ago and have been so inspired by what he has done and what you have done. So thank you, Ocean, for letting me be part of, of today's program. I'm, Absolutely, I'm thank you, Neil. And now we're gonna go ahead and make our transition. Uh, so please stay on if you wanna learn more about Whole Life Club and how you can take action to get results in your life. Again, thank you so much to Dr. Barnard. It's been a joy to have this time with you. And for everybody else, go ahead and stay on with us here now. We'll let Dr. Barnard go. Um, if you are already a member of Whole Life Club, no need to keep on watching. Um, but if you are not, then this is for you right now, uh, specifically. We started this because my dad and colleague, John Robbins and I were, were just sick and tired of seeing so many people who got inspired. They read a book, they attended a webinar or an action hour or an event, and then over time they slipped. They didn't know how to stay with it. They didn't know how to put all that they were learning into action in their life. And we said, you know what, this has got to stop. We've got to find ways that people can stay with this because in the long run, cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, they don't care a heck of a lot how much you know or how many books you read. They care what you eat and how you live. And we wanted to help people get results, not just for a day or a week or a month, but to sustain them for their whole life. And that's really what it's all about. So uh, every month in Whole Life Club, we have a theme. Past themes have been things like brain health, heart health, anti-cancer living, blood sugar balance, boosting your energy levels, and many others. And every month with that theme, you get specific resources, like a collection of recipes, fabulous, delicious recipes every week that help you make progress on that specific month's goals. You get an action checklist every week, an action of the week video from me, um, and you also get um, a monthly action hour with a guest expert and the chance to submit questions in advance, follow up transcripts and action checklists to help you apply everything you're learning. And when you join and you get our entire library of all of our past months, if there's a specific issue you want to address or optimize, it may already be in the library. You can participate, watch the action hour from that month, make the recipes from that month, and it's all yours instantly when you join. Plus every month we keep adding more and going further and going deeper. You also get a community, which is a huge part of it. 
you get a community of other kindred spirits who are on this path, who want to eat well and live well and love well, and who want to support each other and lift each other up. So you can share favorite recipes, breakthroughs, celebrations, struggles, questions, and get real live action support. And it's all moderated by our team at Food Revolution Network. This week, we're covering a series of action hours, as you know. Today's with Dr. Barnard. On Monday, we'll be with Dr. Christy Funk. And on Wednesday, with Dr. Joel Furman. This is a special week. And there's a whole new raft of people joining in Whole Life Club. So we opened up the doors with an incredible offer this week only. So if you want to join, this is your time. Recently, I got to chat with one of our members. Her name is Kathy. She's from Iowa. She said she wanted to share how Whole Life Club had impacted her life. So now we're going to go ahead and roll the video from what Kathy had to say and what Whole Life Club is meaning to her. Here we go. And I have to say, I think what I like the best about Whole Life Club are the action hours, because I love just being repeatedly motivated by these um, knowledgeable, reasonable, uh, dedicated people in their fields that do such a good job of bringing us that information that we need to know on all the related topics. Uh, my challenges before joining, joining the Whole Life Club uh, were not uncommon. I joined Weight Watchers umpteen times in the last few decades and you know up and down with the weight. I've definitely felt benefits since I've been with Whole Life Club. Um, I, I have just lost 30 pounds that really was so effortless compared to past weight loss experiences because I don't have to weigh and measure and write down anything. <laughs> I just changed what I'm eating and that kind of take, took care of that. And so since I lost the 30 pounds, I just have more energy and I can run. I can actually run with my heels up in the air, which I haven't done in, you know, a few decades, I don't think. I was just, you know, jogging and lumbering along at, at the best, but I just have added more exercise and movement because I want to move. It just, that's amazing. I would say joining Whole Life Club is totally worth it. It's motivating. If this is a change you want to make in your life, then it takes the place of a support group, kind of, because you just get constant support and information and encouragement for adopting this new lifestyle or heading in this new direction that you want to, that you want for your life. My participation in Whole Life Club has affected my husband, whom I live with, of course, and his father, uh, who is why we moved here in the first place. So those two are my closest eating partners, and they will go wherever I want to go, and they will eat whatever I put in front of them. <laughs> and my husband is obese, and he's pre-diabetic, and he's not that worried about it. But he's, he, he's just, I guess by being around me, I think he's eating fewer processed foods, but he is eating more good foods because we have good foods in the house now and that is what I fix. And uh, so just by kind of association, he's adopted some better habits. Also last week we went on vacation with two morbidly obese friends and just watching them eat what they eat and drink what they drink, um, it made me feel good by comparison that I'm not doing that. And by the end of the vacation, um, the man said, well, Kathy's inspired me to eat this salad. So he got a big salad, <laughs> instead of, you know, his, what he usually would eat. And then his wife also once had a big salad where she, that was the only time I'd seen her eat a salad. So, and we went on a bike ride, which I guess they haven't been on bikes in years and years. So, you know, I guess it does make a difference just being around people that, you know, it's just raising awareness. You know, here, there are a lot of church meals that we go to, and I don't want to eat any of those foods. <laughs> so, you know, people ask about it, and I try and be just as nice and accepting and non judgmental about it, but at least they know that I'm watching what I eat, and, you know, and they can see that it's made a difference. 
Well, thank you so much to Kathy for sharing those inspiring words. And, and now I want to say this. If you are feeling inspired and you want to implement what you're learning, if you want to put all this into action so you can get real sustained lasting results in your life, then now is your time to step forward. The doors are open right now to join Whole Life Club with a special opportunity this week only to make it all happen for you. So if you want to step forward, I'll see you there. And now I just want to say again how grateful I am that you are part of this community. Now over, over 5,000 strong and growing of Whole Life Club community members. Right now today you're joining in Whole Life Club in this action hour. And I want to say we're all supporting each other and lifting each other up. And I hope you can feel that energy coming across right now. And I hope you will join us on Monday for our next action hour in this series. We'll be on with Dr. Christy Funk to focus on anti-cancer living. On Wednesday, we'll be on with Dr. Joel Furman. It's an incredible week, and I am so thrilled to be sharing it all with you. So now again, if you're interested, if you're inspired, if you're motivated, now is your time to step forward and join Whole Life Club. And I hope you enjoy lots of delicious food, some good deep sleep tonight, beautiful, fabulous exercise. And I wanna thank you for all the ways that you participate in the food revolution. Step by step, one bite at a time, one meal at a time, one relationship at a time. We are spreading the word, we're spreading the love, we're spreading the nutrition, we're changing our lives, we're healing our bodies, and we're healing our world. So enjoy, blessings, I'll see you Monday. Hope to see you in Whole Life Club, and thank you so very much for being with us today. When it comes to cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, and other chronic illness, what really matters isn't how many books you read, how many webinars you attend, or how much you know. What really matters at the end of the day is what you eat and how you live. The science has given us what we need to know. Now it's time for action. It's time to implement and optimize your healthy lifestyle. It's time to get results. It's time to say goodbye to confusion and hello to clarity. It's time to say goodbye to bad habits and hello to good ones. It's time to fall in love with foods that love you back. It's time to join a community that will support you in achieving your goals. It's time for Whole Life Club. Click the link to find out more and to join in now.